All righty, guys. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to everyone, too, that's watching online. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know me, I'm not Corey or Eric, but you guys can call me Austin for short. Uh, getting into our announcements this morning, uh, for those of you guys who don't know, we've been talking about it for weeks, but I'll tell you guys again, is we've got our baptism today at 1.30 at the Coeur d'Alene City Beach. Um, so if you guys, I know we have a lot of kids and people that want to get baptized. If anyone else wants to, it's going to be a great time to show up. Even if you're not getting baptized, we encourage everyone to come out and enjoy some fellowship as well and support those who are taking that step to be baptized like Jesus tells us to do. Um, the second announcement we got is for the youth summer camp taking place August 14th to the 17th. And signups for that are open to middle school and high school students, but it closes at the end of July. So if you guys are wanting to get those kids signed up, they have to sign up at the end of this month. So keep that in mind. And then the last announcement we've got is for Kids Adventure Day coming up July 29th. It's going to take place between 9.30 and 3 p.m. Uh, there's a flyer on the seats next to you guys for getting signed up. Uh, and if you guys know any kids that, that, that want to come, invite any, whoever you want. It's going to be a great time, great teaching, and uh, it's just going to be an amazing time for those kids this summer. Uh, so that's all I've got for announcements. Pastor Eric is going to lead us in prayer now. Whoop. Sorry, sorry. Good morning. Good to be with you guys. Uh, so to begin our prayer time, I've got a couple of prayer announcements I'm going to bring to the table. And the first of which is uh, regarding the baptism. And uh, so we just want to pray for each and every one of the people getting baptized. Uh, you know, that the God would have his spirit upon them, that they would be protected. I know a lot of times with baptism, it's, it's really as if you're, you're stepping out of the foxhole in, into the battle. And uh, the enemy recognizes, and when you're in the battle, it's not surprising if you get shot at. Um, and so that the God would uh, protect these people and prepare them for uh, the spiritual battles that they'll be fighting and that they do so with God's help, through God's strength, and with the tools that he provides. And then the second part of that also is uh, just during the baptism, we're doing it in a public area at the Coeur d'Alene City Beach. There's going to be a lot of other people around that are witnessing this. Just prayer that our church would be a light and a witness, and that there would be some other people going, what are these crazy people doing, dunking each other into the water? What is this all about? And that God would open a door for the gospel, that there would be an opportunity for that. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and pray for that. Austin, would you pray for us? Amen. All right. And so Scott and Gary are now in India on the missions trip that, that God has called them to. Uh, it is now 1148 p.m. Uh, so please don't don't text them and say, hey, we're praying for you. Uh, they've had their first full day. Uh, it was a very, very long flight getting there. And after just a few short hours, Gary had to go speak at a church uh, that was large, even by North Idaho church size standards. Standards. We have some big churches around Idaho, um, and uh, and this is this is a very large church. So anyway, uh, Gary preached a message, and it went well. Uh, and now, hopefully, they are resting comfortably and sleeping, and uh, getting ready for the work tomorrow. So um, yeah, we want to pray for them that that God would use them, that He would give them uh, a vision for what. Uh, Calvary Rathdrum's part is to be with this missions organization and uh, that he would just lead the way for them. Hannah, would you pray for that?
Amen. Amen. All right. So now I want to turn it over to you guys. Is there any prayer requests that you have? Anything going on in your life that you could use prayer for? I'll be patient. Yes. Yes. Okay, okay. And what was his name again? I'm sorry, Daniel. Daniel, okay. I'll, I'll pray for Daniel. Lord, we lift Daniel up to you. First of all, God, we rejoice in the fact that he knows you, that he's walking with you, and God, that he has security beyond any kind of hope that can be given this side of heaven, that, that he is with you. God, we thank you for the fact that you provide us that type of, of solid hope. Uh, God, and we lift him to you. His body, God, that you would heal him. You know exactly what's going on in each and every individual cell within his body. God, we just pray that uh, by your sovereign hand, Lord, that you would change the course of this cancer. And uh, God, that you would minister to him and heal him. Uh, and Lord, we just pray for their entire family, for Tom and Sandy, and um, Lord, for, for everybody else within the family. God, that you would give them strength, that you would give them hope, and uh, Lord, that you would just uh, give them the ability to minister to him as well. God, we thank you. We love you. And uh, God, we just invite your Holy Spirit here for this service, Lord, that you would... Uh, teach us, that you would comfort us, that you would convict us, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would be free to do the work within us that needs to be done. God, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, so we've got a couple of minutes now. If you guys want to stand up and greet one another, and if you can find somebody that you don't know, make sure to introduce yourself.
All right. You can go ahead and stand back up now that you sat down. Welcome again. I thought it was hot out there, but there's people in here wearing beanies, so it must be pretty cold. Whew. <laughs> All right, you didn't hear me. Let's worship the Lord. <laughs> I want to sing it out from every mountain top. Your goodness knows no. Never stops. Your mercy follows me. Your kindness fills my life. Your love amazes me. Let's sing. So I sing because you are good, and I dance because you are good, and I'll shout because you are good. You're so good to me, to me, yeah. Darkest night, 
you are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful So, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Your goodness is running after It's running after me Your goodness is running after It's running after running after me with my life laid down I'm surrendered now I give you everything your goodness is running after it's running after me all my life you have been faithful goodness of God. I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, Lord, we sing of your goodness. You are so good. Lord, we love you. We pray that this morning that we would truly come here to, to hear your word, Lord, to truly worship you, to learn of you, to grow to know more about you, Lord. Make yourself known this morning. We would see Jesus in this place today. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and be seated. One thing I know for sure is that every last one of us is far too familiar with sin, the ugly consequences that come from our sin, and with the regret that we so deeply feel because of it. You don't have to think back very far to find something that you wish you hadn't said, right? Or is it just me? I don't think most of us have to think back very far to think of you know, something that we wish we hadn't done or something that we wish we'd done differently. I think worst of all, we have to watch others suffer because of the consequences of the choices that we've made. Only someone who is incredibly self-absorbed would be unaware of the fact that at times others are impacted negatively by our own bad choices. Only the true narcissist isn't troubled when they see others paying a price for their sin. Every healthy person is at times troubled by their own personal moral failings. Even the Apostle Paul, in Scripture, he, he laments to the church in Rome. He says, I don't do the good things that I want to do, but instead I, I practice the evil that I don't want to do. Many of us have deep, lasting regret over the sinful choices that have led to just tragically awful outcomes. 
You know, though, regret, regret itself is, is actually a healthy and accurate evaluation of our guilt. But it's, it's what we do with regret. It's what we do with it that, that determines whether it becomes a negative or, believe it or not, even a positive impact upon our lives. You see, if we, if we forget the redemptive work of the cross, we let the enemy begin to convert our regret into condemnation or despair, it will eventually destroy us. But, but if we will give ourselves and our regret to Jesus, he will convert our guilt into transformed living and even a greater comprehension of God's grace than we have ever had before. And he will, through it, shape us for the better. With that in mind, I want us to take a look at our text for this morning, found in 1 Samuel chapters 21 and 22. Yes, yeah, some knucklehead thought it would be good to take two chapters this morning. So if you can stand that long, I invite you to stand with me. If you can't stand that long, it's okay. Um, and let's take a look at our passage. I'll read it. I really do encourage you to follow along in your own Bible. 1 Samuel chapter 21, beginning, of course, in verse 1. David went to the priest Ahimelech at Nob. Ahimelech was afraid to meet David, so he said to him, Why are you alone and no one is with you? David answered the priest Ahimelech, the king gave me a mission, but he told me, don't let anyone know anything about the mission I'm sending you on or what I ordered you to do. I have stationed my young men at a certain place. Now, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever can be found. The priest told him, there's no ordinary bread on hand. However, there is consecrated bread, but the young man may eat it only if they have kept themselves from women. David answered him, I swear that women are being kept from us, as always when I go out to battle. The young men's bodies are consecrated, even on an ordinary mission, so of course their bodies are consecrated today. So the priest gave him the consecrated bread for there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from the presence of the Lord. And when the bread was removed, it had been replaced with warm bread. One of Saul's servants, detained before the Lord, was there that day. His name was Doeg the Edomite, chief of Saul's shepherds. David said to Ahimelech, Do you have a spear or a sword on hand? I didn't even bring my sword or my weapons since the king's mission was urgent. The priest replied, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Eli, is here, wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want to take it for yourself, then take it, for there isn't another one here. There's none like it, David said. Give it to me. David fled that day from Saul's presence. And he went to King Achish of Gath. But Achish's servants said to him, Isn't this David, the king of the land? And don't they sing about him during their dances? As Saul had killed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. David took this to heart and became very afraid of King Achish of Gath. So he pretended to be insane in their presence. He acted like a madman around them, scribbling on the doors of the city gate and letting saliva run down into his beard. Look, you can see this man is crazy, Achish told his servants. Why did you bring him to me? Hey, do I have a shortage of crazy people that you brought this one to act crazy around me? Is this one going to come into my house? So David left Gath and took refuge in the cave of Adullam. When David's brothers and his father's whole family heard, they went down and joined him there. 
In addition, every man who was desperate in debt or discontented rallied around him, and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. Uh, from there, David went to Mizpah of Moab, uh, where he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and mother stay with you until I know what God will do for me. So he left them in the care of the king of Moab, and they stayed with him the whole time David was in the stronghold. Then the prophet Gad said to David, Don't stay in the stronghold. Leave and return to the land of Judah. So David left and went into the forest of Hereth. And Saul heard that David and his men had been discovered. At that time, Saul was in Gibeah, sitting under the tamarisk tree at the high place. His spear was in his hand, and all his servants were standing around him. Saul said to his servants, Listen, men of Benjamin. Is Jesse's son going to give all of you fields and vineyards? Do you think he'll make all of you commanders of thousands and commanders of hundreds? That's why all of you have conspired against me. And nobody tells me when my own son makes a covenant with Jesse's son. None of you cares about me or tells me that my son has stirred up my own servant to wait in ambush for me as is the case today. Then Doag the Edomite, who was in charge of Saul's servants, answered, I saw Jesse's son come to Ahimelech, son of Ahiatub, at Nob. I made it through this two and a half times. Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for him and gave him provisions. He also gave him the sword of Goliath, the Philistine. And the king sent messengers to summon the priest Ahimelech, son of Ahiatub, and his father's whole family, who were priests at Nob. All of them came to the king. Then Saul said, Listen, son of Ahiatub, I'm at your service, my lord, he said. Saul asked him, why did you and Jesse's son conspire against me? You gave him bread and a sword and inquired of God for him so that he could rise up against me and wait in ambush as is the case today. Ahimelech replied to the king, who among all your servants is as faithful as David? He is the king's son-in-law, captain of your bodyguard and honored in your house. Was today the first time I inquired of God for him? Of course not. Please don't let the king make an accusation against your servant or any of my father's family, for your servant didn't have any idea about all this. But the king said, You will die, Ahimelech, you and your father's whole family. Then the king ordered the guards standing by him, Turn and kill the priests of the Lord because they sided with David, for they knew he was fleeing, but they didn't tell me. But the king's servants would not lift a hand to execute the priest of the Lord. So the king said to Doag, Go and execute the priests. So Doag the Edomite went and executed the priests himself. On that day he killed 85 men who wore linen ephods, he also struck down Nob, the city of the priests, with the sword, both men and women, infants and nursing babies, oxen, donkeys, and sheep. However, one of the sons of Ahimelech, son of Ahiatub, escaped. His name was Abiathar, and he fled to David. Abiathar told David that Saul had killed the priests of the Lord. Then David said to Abiathar, I knew that Doeg the Edomite was there that day and that he was sure to report to Saul. I myself am responsible for the lives of everyone in your father's family. Stay with me. Don't be afraid, for the one who wants to take my life wants to take your life. You will be safe with me. Let's pray. Father. We thank you for this morning, for time together, for your word, and for our teacher, your Holy Spirit. God, I ask that this morning you would help us to 
to see and to understand the truths of your word. God, I pray that, that, that we could see how it is that you took such immense guilt and regret in the life of David. And God, you transformed it and you transformed him through that. God, I pray that, uh, that we would be able to avail ourselves of these same truths, that we might experience that same experience ourselves, that we might experience that transformation of regret into thankfulness for your goodness and your mercy. God, I pray that we grab hold of that this morning. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Well, let's remember what, what has taken place so far. Uh, King Saul, because of his insecure paranoia, has decided that his most loyal soldier... David, he, he, is, he thinks that he, David is seeking to usurp the throne. And so Saul, even though the Lord who, who made him to be king has since rejected him as king because of his own stubborn rebellion, because Saul wants more than anything to continue as king, he has again and again sought to murder David. Until now, David, once and for all, flees from Saul. At verse 1, chapter 21, David went to Nob, to the priest Ahimelech. But Ahimelech, even in seeing David, is afraid to meet with him and begins asking questions. Why are you alone? Well, why is no one with you? Uh, maybe Ahimelech had heard about Saul's first attempt at spearing David, or maybe just somehow... He sensed that something was wrong. Something just wasn't right about all this. And so he begins to question David. David, what's going on? Well, why are you alone? Well, what are you doing? And in response, instead of trusting the priest of God with the truth, David lies. Verse 2, the king gave me a mission, but he told me, don't let any of these nosy priests know anything about the mission I'm sending you on. So quit asking so many stinking questions, Ahimelech, because I'm under orders from the king and I'm out doing God's business and yet you're just getting to be too nosy, man. And then in order to get what he wants from Ahimelech, he lies some more. Verse 2, I've stationed my young men at a certain place. So tell me, what are my resources? What do you have on hand? Give me at least five loaves of bread. And now we come to the first rabbit trail of this passage. It's the bread. You see, Ahimelech didn't have any bread to give to David, at least not any normal bread. What he did have is what they called consecrated bread. It was consecrated because it was bread that had been used in the worship of God. Now, you might be wondering, how do you use bread to worship God? Oh, well, here's kind of what, the, uh, what that was all about. Uh, the priest would each week put 12 fresh loaves of bread onto a table inside the tent uh, there where God's presence was manifested. Well, how in the world does that worship God? Well, I think the thought here is this. Uh, the presence of these loaves of bread there within the tent where God revealed himself was to be a reminder to the 12 tribes of the amazing honor that they had, just like the loaves of bread, to be in the presence of God. And I think the, the subtle message there was you don't deserve it any more than 12 loaves of bread deserve it. But you get this privilege, you get this honor of being in the very presence of God. And so week by, week by week, fresh loaves would be placed there regularly. And when the old loaves were taken out, the priests were then allowed to eat the bread as long as they were ceremonially clean. And here, Ahimelech extends this privilege to David and to his imaginary men, saying the men may eat the bread if 
they have kept themselves from women. Now, what's the matter with women? Uh, well, what's the deal with that? Well, uh, part of being ceremonially clean was being fully set apart for God's purposes. It, it, it meant that you were not distracted by your own pursuits, you know, the, uh, the seeking of your own pleasure. You weren't distracted by other things. And so the men were not to have had sexual relations in order that their minds might be uh, focused solely upon the things of the Lord, which David assures him is the case in this situation. He promises that none of his imaginary men have been with an imaginary woman. And so then, verse 7, uh, David notices that one of Saul's servants who was detained before the Lord, who was there, uh, his name Doag the Edomite, so his name tells us he is not an Israelite, but he is a man from Edom, David sees one of Saul's loyal and, and rather an unprincipled man uh, there at Nob, and that, that reminds David that he has no weapons with him. As suddenly he, he is very aware of the fact that he is completely unarmed. And so he asks Ahimelech uh, for one more thing, provide me with a weapon. Uh, but the only weapon there, verse 9, is the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom David killed. Remember that? Uh, pleased with this, David exclaims, there's none like it. So it was in some way a very unique sword. And David asks for it to be given to him. And so verse 10, David fled and went from there, and he went to King Achish of Gath. That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. What in the world was David thinking? You know, it, you give yourself over to a lack of faith and you begin doing a lot of things that, that maybe later on you'll realize you never should have been doing. I think David will look back on the things that he said to Ahimelech with regret. He'll look back at, at where he ran in the midst of his fear with great regret. Here, the leader of Israel's army seeks to hide, to find refuge where? In the midst of Israel's enemy. He goes to Gath. That's a Philistine city. He's been fighting the Philistines, and he runs to them to hide. And, and what sort of disguise is he wearing? Well, he's wearing the unique sword of the Philistines' greatest hero, whom he killed. And he goes to Goliath's hometown to hide. Not the best idea he ever had. I mean, what could go wrong? Um, it's no surprise when he is uh, very quickly recognized. Uh, verse 12, Achish's servants said to him, isn't this David, you know, the king of Israel? Uh, the one that they sing about, David has killed his tens of thousands. By the way, tens of thousands what? Philistines. He's killed tens of thousands of Philistines. And so uh, now David suddenly finds himself found out, and, and, and he's, he's terrified. And that's how it goes, isn't it? it you, you're just stupid with sin for a while. And then all of a sudden your eyes get open, and you realize what an idiot you've been. And here David, it, he's terrified. And so he comes up with a solution. He comes up with his own his own escape, he pretends to be insane. He acts like a madman, scribbling on the doors of the city gate and letting saliva run down his beard. Now, that may not seem like a, that embarrassing of a thing for you or for me, uh, but understand this, in, in his culture in that day, this was the basest of humiliations. Uh, and, and remember this as well. This isn't you or me uh, acting like we're nuts. Some people would say we don't have to act. This was David who was a warrior. This was David who had fought and who had dominated the Philistines. And now, now terrified by the Philistines, he is, he is feigning madness in order that he might escape with his life. David utterly humiliates himself. 
He does it well. King Achish is convinced. Not impressed, but he is convinced. Verse 14, the man is crazy. Why did you bring him to me? You know, is there a shortage of crazy people around here that you're out hunting for more? And, and so Achish sends him on his way. And so David now absolutely disgraced. By the way, this probably would have been something that would have followed David. This would not have been something that the people would have just forgotten and let go. Disgraced, he escapes from the, a trap of his own creation. It's interesting, though, because in, in Psalm 34, we're given a window into the heart, to the mind of David as he reflects upon all that took place there in Gath, fleeing there, realizing his stupidity, <coughs> disgracing himself with an act of madness. But as David reflects on these things, his reflections are maybe not what you or I would expect if we base them upon our own reflections, upon our own regret over our own past sin and failure. Listen to what David says in verses four through six. He says, I sought the Lord. He answered me, rescued me from all my fears. Those who look to him and this is what I find to be unexpected, are radiant with joy. Is that how you react when you are immersed in regret? Are you radiant with joy when your sin has been exposed to the world at large? David says their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man Speaking of himself, David says, cried, cried to God, and the Lord heard him and saved him from all his troubles. Notice how David responds to this it, ultimate of humbling lessons. And notice that it, 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 David does not wallow in his shame. He does not surrender to condemnation. But yet rather, uh, David somehow finds himself encased in joy, enraptured in the celebration of God's gracious goodness. The Lord uses this relatively small lesson here in Gath, and, and I, I get it, I know, it, it probably did not feel small to him at the time, it never does, does it? And yet God used this lesser lesson about regret in order to prepare him for far greater regrets that he would feel in the future. Well, on to chapter 22. There in verse 1, we see that David took refuge in the cave of Adullam, uh, which is back in Israelite territory. And when David's family heard, they joined him there. And now likely uh, they too found themselves either fearful of or uh, actually in danger from Saul. And so they go and they join David there in the cave. And uh, well, not only them, look at verse two. In addition, every man who was desperate, in debt, or discontented. Those are some great qualifications, aren't they? They rallied around David and he became their leader. About 400 men were with him. And so this rather motley crew begins to form around David. And certainly it's not the best looking group that ever gathered together. But I think you and I, we would be wise to remember that their condition at the start is not nearly as significant as their condition at the finish. They were an incredibly rough lot coming in. 
They were men who were desperate, who were in debt, who were discontented. They were men who knew a lot of regret. But by the end of their time with David, by the end of their time with him, 1 Chronicles 12, 8 describes them very differently. There we are told that they had become valiant warriors, trained for battle, expert with shield and spear. Uh, Their faces were like the faces of lions and they were as swift as gazelles upon the mountains. That's good news for us, you know. It's good news for us because scripture describes us. It describes the church of God. The body of Christ. First Corinthians chapter one verse twenty six describes us as well. Not many wise. Got to be honest. That's us. Not many powerful. Not hard to see that. Not many of noble birth. Probably could have just said none. You and I, we know and we are grateful for the fact that our Jesus takes all who are weary and heavy laden. Aren't you glad for that? Because that describes us as we come in, isn't it? It says all who are, who are weary and heavy laden come to me. But remember, how we come in is not how we go out. We come in weary and heavy laden, but remember... He makes us into new creations in Christ. All of David's men, they came in laden with regret. But they are led by a shepherd king who is learning how to funnel regret through repentance. Take note of that. That point is key. Repentance is the door through which regret must pass for it to be transformed. David's figuring that out. He learned about that in Gath. He's learning more about it now. Because that's how the Lord turns regret into a greater thankfulness and a greater comprehension of the enormity of his gracious forgiveness. Look at verse 3. David went to the king of Moab, asking, please let my father and my mother stay with you until I know what it is that God will do for me. And he left them there in the care of the king of Moab. And so David does not yet know what God is going to do. He doesn't know how it's going to go. He doesn't know when God is going to to act. And so he takes his parents and he wants them to be in a place that is safe. And so he takes them out of Israel to Moab. And and why Moab? Well, remember, his great-grandmother was who? Ruth. Ruth, the Moabitess. And so they have family connections there in Moab. And so he takes his family there. And there they are safe. They are out of Saul's reach. But then in verse 5, look. The prophet Gad told David, don't stay there. Don't stay there. Leave. Come back. Come back to the land of Judah. Here we see David, unlike Saul. Saul, who only obeyed God when uh, God's commands coincided uh, with Saul's own wishes. Here, David, though he is going in the opposite direction, when God says no, when God says return, uh, David turns around. He returns to Israel. He returns right to within Saul's reach. I don't know, but I think a good part of the reason that God wanted David to come back, not just into Israel, but very much so back into reach of Saul is that he wants David to learn there is no refuge. There is no fortress beside me in which you should put your trust. You thought you were safe there in Moab. You thought you were protected there. But what you need to learn is the only place that you are truly protected 
is when you are right in the center of my will. Well, sure enough, as soon as David and his 400 men returned, kind of hard to to hide a group of 400. Verse 6, Saul heard that David and his men had discovered. Uh, But uh, Saul is distracted. Uh, David doesn't need to worry yet. Uh, Saul is not yet coming after David. He is too busy uh, seeking to consolidate his power base, to secure Uh, the loyalty of those who have gathered around him. And he is using the age-old tools of the world in order to secure the loyalty of those around him, Uh, the tools of accusation, intimidation, and murder. And so there, partway through verse 6, Saul was in Gibeah, sitting under a tree, a spear in his hand. It's never a good thing when Saul has a spear in his hand. And so his servants were there, nervously, I'm sure, standing around him, ready at any moment to duck. And Saul said to his servants, listen, men of Benjamin. And note there, Saul has surrounded himself uh, with men from the tribe of Benjamin because he is from the tribe of Benjamin. And so he's seeking to to pull around himself those whom he thinks will be loyal to him. And he just reminds them of this dynamic. He says, listen, we're Benjaminites, uh, but Jesse's son, he is not. And Jesse's son, remember that's David. Saul will no longer say David's name. He just calls him Jesse's son. That's a pattern we see with Saul. Whenever he's mad at someone, he quits using their name and, and just refers to them being the son of whoever their father is. And so he says, Jesse's son isn't going to give you the bribes that I've given you. Uh, be sure of that. Uh, remember, he's from the tribe of Judah. Uh, he isn't going to take care of you Benjaminites the way that I have. He's manipulating these guys trying to convince them that it's in their own self-interest to stay loyal to him. But then Saul jumps from manipulation straight into accusation and doesn't even uh, provide any sort of transition. Uh, Verse 8, all of you have conspired against me. Seriously? All of you? Yes, all of you. I'm accusing all of you of treason. Nobody tells me when my own son, he won't even say Jonathan's name now, when my own son makes a covenant with Jesse's son, none of you cares about me or tells me that my son has stirred up my own servant to wait in ambush for me, as is the case today. Let me ask you this. Is David waiting in ambush for Saul? No. It's nonsense. None of this is true. None of it. But that doesn't matter to Saul. Understand this. Saul doesn't care about truth. His only aim, his only goal is to motivate these guys, uh, to put them in a situation, to make an accusation against them so that they are forced to prove their loyalty to him. First in line, verse 9, is Doag, the Edomite, a foreign slave, probably a captive from Saul's campaign against Edom earlier on. He, he is the first who is eager to prove his loyalty, to clear his name, uh, to redirect Saul's paranoid accusations away from himself and onto someone else. And so he throws suspicion onto someone else, someone who he knows good and well is innocent. Doag uh, redirects all of Saul's paranoia towards the priest, to Ahimelech. Doag says, well, now that you mention it, I saw Jesse's son come to Ahimelech at Nob. He calls him Ahimelech. When Saul refers to him from now on, he's the son of Ahiatub. He's on the bad list because Doag put him there. 
What does Doag accuse him of? Well, Ahimelech inquired of the Lord for the son of Jesse, and he gave him provisions, and he also gave him the sword of Goliath. Now, everything that Doag says here is true, isn't it? Factually, Ahimelech did do all of those things. But what Doag said was, absolutely false in the implications and the insinuations that he tied them to. Doeg is purposefully making Ahimelech look bad in order to redirect Saul's wrath away from himself and towards someone else. And it works. It works well. Verse 11, the king summoned Ahimelech and his whole family being faithful servants of the king, they, they all came. They all came. And then verse 13, Saul begins to use a question to make an accusation. Someone done that to you lately? They ask a question, but it's not really a question. It's an accusation. And so he says this, why did you and Jesse's son conspire against me? Huh? Why'd you do it? What is he talking about? You gave him bread, a sword. You inquire to God for him so that he could rise up against me. Now, in the midst of this, don't forget, don't forget, Ahimelech is in this bad situation. He is in a terrible position. He is vulnerable to accusation. Why? Because David lied to him. Because David didn't tell him the truth about what was going on. Verse 14, Ahimelech tries to reason with Saul. He says, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Name one person in your kingdom who is more loyal to you, more faithful than David. Who? Who is more faithful? He is, have you forgotten? Your son-in-law. He is the captain of your own bodyguard. There is no one more trustworthy so did I help him? Yes, I helped him. He, it's my job to help him. Why are you accusing me of treason? I had no idea that anything was going on. Saul, however, doesn't seem to hear a word that Ahimelech says. He simply responds, you're going to die. Verse 16, you will die. And not only you, you and your father's whole family. And then the king ordered the guards standing by him, turn and kill the priests of the Lord because they sided with David. But the king's servants, the guards, would not lift a hand to execute the priests of the Lord. It seems that Saul is the only one who isn't convinced of Ahimelech's innocence. So Saul turns to Doeg, this unprincipled man, the one who, and I think this is key, falsely accused Ahimelech. And he commands him to murder both the priests and his family. And Doeg, who knows the man is innocent, he kills him. King said to Doeg, go and execute the priest. And so Doeg the Edomite went and executed the priest himself. He killed all 85 of them. And then he slaughtered their families. Friends, know this. When truth is abandoned, there is no end. There is no limit, no backstop to the depravity that will come. Be aware of that. It was true then, and I promise you, it is true in our day as well. Think about the, uh, the process here that went on uh, with this guy, Doeg. It, it, it began with Doeg bending the truth with him couching the situation in such a way that it, it threw guilt upon Ahimelech 
And once he bent the truth, he had no problem abandoning the truth. Once he abandoned the truth, he had no problem executing an innocent man. And once he executed one innocent man, he found it easier to wrongly kill 84 others as well. And having killed all the priests, he came to the place where it was no problem at all for him to kill the women and the children and the babies. There was no limit to the depravity that he could then commit. That's how it works. It's how it worked then. It's how it works today. The conscious rejection of various truths within our culture, in our day, is leading us to great evil. But even more serious is the fact that our culture has abandoned truth itself. Our culture has become unmoored from, from all absolutes. And so it, it no longer has any basis upon which to understand anything as being genuinely good or as being authentically evil. All things are now just examined in the light of preference and opinion. But that's not reality. No one can, can actually live like that. And for goodness sake, you can't even get out of bed without availing yourself of the basic reality that, uh, that some things are just true and therefore other things are just not true. How do you get out of bed if you don't even know if you're in or out of bed already? <laughs> well, you can't. Letting go of truth is a dangerous thing. Doeg let go of truth, and great evil ensued. You and I, you and I living in the midst of this world gone mad, we have got to cling to, and we have to live our lives based upon truth, no matter what this world does. You and I, we have not only got to live our lives based on truth, but you and I, we have got to become ambassadors of the truth. We have got to speak truth, and we have got to seek to try to help those around us, and not to condemn them, and not to mock them, not to, to just fight with them, but to help them understand, to see the reality that without truth, we are all going to suffer great. Well, finally, we come to the closing scene. Verse 20, one of the priests, Abiathar, escaped, escaped from Saul and Doeg. He fled to David. And when he told David that Saul had killed all of the priests, I have to imagine David was devastated. David turns to, Do to, David turns to Abiathar and he says, you know, I knew Doeg was there that day. And I knew he would report it to Saul. And so I'm responsible. It's my fault. I'm responsible for the loss of life of everyone in your father's family. And then he says to him, stay with me. He can't bring them back. He can't fix what has been broken. But he tells Abiathar, stay with me. The one who's after you, he's after me too. Don't worry, I'll protect you. Here David sees, he realizes, and he owns. He confesses. He he. He takes responsibility for the horrible consequences of his sin. Now, 
David didn't kill them, did he? But he did lie. He lied to Ahimelech, and that made him vulnerable. Saul sinned far worse. <laughs> Doeg it topped them all. He sinned most grievously. And yet David doesn't play the comparison game. He doesn't push the blame onto Saul and Doeg. He, he didn't let their far greater evil keep himself from admitting his own sin, from confessing his own responsibility, and, the, and for taking ownership of the horrific chain of events that, it, that were unleashed. You know, I look at this, and, and honestly, I think it, 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 it's a wonder that such immense guilt did not absolutely destroy David. I, I'm stunned that this isn't the last thing that we read of David in the account of, of Scripture. You would think that he would recede into the background, that he would withdraw back within himself as he struggles with the regret and guilt that he must have felt. How do you bear that kind of a weight? How do you carry uh, that sort of guilt with you? I'll tell you this, if you do, it's going to destroy you. David had great regret. But you know what David knew? He knew what you and I need to know. That regardless of how great his regret was, God's grace is greater. God's grace is greater. So when his, his tremendous regret began to ferment into shame and condemnation, instead of hiding in humiliation and being destroyed by this, David repented. He confessed his sin. And, and that's, that's so key. And that is the doorway through which we've got to shove regret so that we can come through to the other side and we can know redemption. So David, instead of being buried in condemnation, he finds himself exalted with joy, with a celebration of the immensity and the goodness of God's gracious forgiveness. And dear friends, you and I, we can experience that too. It is simple. It is so simple. 1 John 1, 9. Guys, you, you ought to know this. I, I should be driving you nuts with how often I quote this. You should know this by heart by this point, that, it, that if we confess our sin, if we will own our sin, that he, that God is faithful and what? Faithful and just. And what will he do for you? Not just for others. What will he do for you? He will forgive you and he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Know that that is truth. Know that that is reality. You don't have to walk in regret and guilt and shame and condemnation. You can join David as he cries out in Psalm 43, 34. I sought the Lord. I sought the Lord and he answered me. And he rescued me from all my fears. Those who look to him, they're radiant with joy. Their faces will never be ashamed. This poor man, David himself, cried. And the Lord heard him and saved him from all his trouble. You know, a man who did what David did should have had a face of shame. He should have had a burden of condemnation. But because he confessed his sin, 
the goodness and the graciousness of God released him and freed him just like he'll do for us. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would help us and not just to uh, intellectually comprehend these, these truths, but God, very experientially, that we would grab hold of them, that we would cling to you, that we would confess our sin openly, that we would own what we have done, our guilt, and we would receive from you cleansing, forgiveness that only you can grant so that we might, instead of walking in condemnation and fear, walk in joy and rejoice over the goodness and the faithfulness, the sufficiency of our God and Savior. Work that in us, Lord. We pray it in Jesus' name. Let's stand and worship him together.
That's our, our cry and our prayer, Lord, that by your refining fire, Lord, that you would make us holy, set apart, ready to do your will. Lord, we worship you because you are holy, because you are worthy, because you alone are worthy to be praised. Purify our hearts, Lord. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you in just a few minutes out in CDA. I said last service, wear a sweatshirt and pants because it's cold out there. <laughs>